For 18 seasons, Dikembe Mutombo graced the NBA, later became a member of the NBA Hall of Fame. He has gone on to be a respected philanthropist, someone who has a tremendous heart for the people of the world, and somewhere along the way, he and his wife Rose and children became members of Eastside Church in Marietta, Georgia. And for almost five years now, it's been my privilege to be their, their pastor. With all that's going on in our nation and the world these days, I thought it would be good to have Dikembe come and share some conversational thoughts about the world and justice and what is going on. And Dikembe, I'm glad you came. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a real privilege. I, I got from you yesterday an article that you were featured in in the, in the Denver yeah. Post where you used yes. to play for the Nuggets. And uh, the headline is, Dikembe Mutombo, our lives mean nothing if we're silent about George Floyd. And then let me just read a little bit here to set this up. In the article, it says, prior to Wednesday night, NBA legend Dikembe Mutombo had only seen short clips of the Minneapolis officer, police officer digging his knee into George Floyd's neck. But that night, as he lumbered downstairs in his Atlanta home for a workout, he couldn't look away from the excruciating 10-minute video that captured Floyd's death. Mutombo was so distraught he couldn't finish his workout. I cried yesterday by myself at the gym, he said. I stopped working out, and I cried like for 10 minutes. This has had a major impact on your life, and I know you've been speaking out about it, and I thought in this historic time in the life of our nation and in our church, as we're not able to gather together still because of COVID-19, I thought it'd be good for you if you could to come in and share your thoughts, talk to the East Side family and through television, the broader audience, your thoughts as to what has happened and what needs to happen as a Christ follower. You love Jesus very, very much. Your wife graces us with prayer here often in this room when no one else is around. You're very serious about humanity. You're very serious about Jesus and who he is in your life. As a follower of Jesus Christ, as a, a global personality, a global citizen, what's going on in your heart and life right now that you'd like to share with us? And we'd love to learn a few things and enlighten us. So I'll be quiet and I'll listen to what you have to say. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Pastor. Um, thank you for giving me the platform. Um, as you know, as a Christian, the Bible is asking us to have faith, to walk by faith, not by sight. And uh, I think uh, through my faith, that's where I'm gaining my, my, my strength. Because it's been a few nights, uh, especially on the past uh, seven days here, I've been losing my sleep a little bit. And uh, I've been praying a lot. If you look at my social media, I've been asking everybody in America and around the globe that we need to pray because our world is not changing. Our world is not moving. That uh, we need to get better from where we are today. As a father of a two young black boys, as an African myself, I'm becoming a little bit concerned about my children. You know, I'm scared. You know, what I mean I'm scared, it's not like I'm scared yesterday or I'm scared the day before. I'm scared today and I'm scared tomorrow. What can be happening to my kids if they leave their house today? Um, because my son, who is a great basketball player, who is really um, very gifted, maybe he have a chance to becoming way much better than me as a basketball player. Uh, and he go jog a lot in the neighborhood where we live at. He always go jog in front of the house on the street. After seeing what happened in uh, Brunswick, Brunch, Georgia, yeah. Brunswick, Georgia, that was like almost a couple months ago. Yeah. Then I was like, whoa, what is going on here? That could be my son. And I was living already with fears. 
And I was asking my son that every time you want to go jog, let me pull the car all the way to the driveway and let me watch you as you're jogging because I'm scared. Then I watched what happened to George Floor seven days ago. It's becoming much difficult for me. As you look at it in the article, as you was reading it, I cry. I cry as a human being. And uh, I wonder why we are not moving, why the policeman felt that he did have a right to put his knee to somebody else's neck until the man cannot breathe no more. I was thinking about myself. It can be me. That could be Because you. I've been arrested a few times right. for no reason. You know, before we start the show today, I told you that I have a personal story that I never shared that to so many people. On my wedding day, Pastor, let me open my heart today sure, because please. I don't like to. You know, I, I'm a good man, but I, I have so much stuff have happened in my life that sometimes I like to keep so many of them inside. On my wedding day, the day I married my wife, 24 years ago, June 15, which we were on the month for my wedding. Yeah. I was on my way to the train station to pick up my teammate who was a groom man at the wedding. It's going to be in your wedding. But he didn't have a ride from his house to my place because I was living in the suburb of Washington. And uh, they did have only one car to drive between him and his wife. And his wife was going to come to the wedding in the afternoon. He said, Dick, as you want everybody to be in your house by 11 o'clock, why don't you let me catch a train to meet you at the train station so you can meet me there and pick me up and so you can take me to home? Because from the train station where I used to live in Maryland in Potomac, there's no bus go from the train station to my house where I was living. If you don't have a car, you can come to the neighborhood. So I went to pick up my Reggie William, who was my teammate. As I was picking up Reggie, I came to the train. The train did have two exits. So I forgot which exit Reggie was going to come in. I went to the other side where the bus came in. I thought maybe he would come that way. But he ended up going where the, uh, the taxi come to pick up people up. So I got there, got out of the car, I parked my BMW 7 uh, series. It was just a brand new car. So I got up and I stood there as tall as I am, and I closed the door. It was a tender window vehicle. Then I started looking around. I said, where's Reggie? Where is he? He's supposed to be here. He told me he's going to be here in five minutes. I started looking and looking. Then I took a few steps out away from my car and came back, took a couple steps out again, came back by the door because the engine was still running. Pastor, you're not going to believe. By the time I realized that Reggie might not be here, might be another style, let me drive, go to the other side of the train station. I get inside my car, and I went maybe 30 yards away. Next time I knew I was surrounding by 10 police vehicles from Montgomery uh, County Police Station, policemen. And with all the guns like that on my head, we saw you, get your hands up, we saw you. We saw you stealing the car. Get your hands up, don't move, you can get shot. I was like, first I just took, I stayed calm, I said, what are you talking about? This is my car. They said, no, shut up. This is not your car, we see you stealing the car, we watch you for more than 30 minutes. I said, what? oh, we watch you through all the security cameras. I said, this is my car. I came to pick up somebody. Put your hands up. So, so I had my hands outside my window. The car was still running. Surrounding with all the policemen, with all the guns out. And I said, you don't know who I am? This was the 96. The guy said, I don't care who you are. I said, you don't know who I am. I grew up here in town, in D.C. Georgetown School. He said, we don't care. I said, I went to Georgetown. The guy keep looking at me. They all have their guns out. I said, I'm the Kembe Mutombo, the basketball player. 
Then there was one police, a black police officer, hear my voice. And when I said I was Dikemi Mutombo, he said, you what? You Dikemi Mutombo, what are you doing here? I said. Then right away, he asked all of his friends to put their guns down. He said, that Dikemi Mutombo, the basketball player. I said, I came to pick up my teammate. I'm getting married in a few hours. I just came to pick up my teammate. He didn't have no ride. Then right away, all of them put their guns on. It was such an embarrassed situation. And there were people who were coming out from the train station, from the bus station. Everybody was looking at me. They thought maybe it was a drug bastard. Yeah. And I told myself, I was telling my wife that yesterday when you call us. I said, we're talking about George. I said, honey, I almost got killed on my wedding day. Few hours before my wedding. Why my mom and dad who are no longer with me today, but they were at home waiting for me to come back because I went to prison. All of my brothers, that tell you what's going on in this country. So 25 years later, you see that happen, something like that happen. Something is happening. Worse. Yeah. So nothing has not changed that much. We need to change our heart in this country. You know, we cannot judge people because of the color of their skin. You have to arrest somebody because of he did something, not because that person is black or is brown or whatever that person is from. And fast forward 25 years later, you are world-renowned, known. God's been very good to you, blessed you, blessed you and your family in a lot of ways. When I arrive at the Atlanta airport and go up the escalators from the train to the baggage area, I see your picture welcoming me to Atlanta along with other Atlanta celebrities. And yet 25 years later, I come back again. You're concerned about the next generation, your sons, one who's 19, the other 16. Uh, I'm worrying about what kind of world are we living to them. So let me just ask as, uh, as, as your friend, your pastor in, 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 in 2020, what, what do you, I was watching Tony Evans with my wife on a clip a couple nights ago, renowned exposure of the word of God, African-American pastor out of Dallas. And he was surrounded by his grandsons. And he began to tell stories about himself in an earlier era, but it echoes what you said in about the 90s and what we saw with George Floyd and what we saw down in Brunswick. Um, he was talking to his sons about, the grandsons, about how he talked to his sons and now grandsons about the police when they approach. It, and, and for uh, folks like me, um, I was taught to be polite and respectful to police officers, but there's another level of concern and protection. Is it something that you've talked to your sons about going way back about once they began to drive or in your car to watch out. I, I, take me into that, us into that family conversation, if you can. Uh, because my, wife, my, my beautiful wife is having, a, we've been having that deep conversation because both of my boys are driving now. And uh, I have one who's 16 years old. The other one is 19. Um, I can even show you a text message that I put in a family group chat. That no matter what, what time of the day you're leaving the house, even you're going to get a coffee or a hot chocolate on the corner, please just write to the family chat, say that, dad and mom, I'm going to McDonald, I'm going to Chick-fil-A, I'm going somewhere. Just let us know. That way we can look at our clock. Either we were sleeping, we wake up, I can see. Your car is not there. At least in my mind, I know where did you go. And I can figure out if it's becoming much longer, I can walk down the street if I don't see you coming back. It's becoming a big concern. You know, it's very difficult to watch so many injustices that have been going on in this country. And what I, and I say to you, because I love you, you're my brother, you're famous. Yes. You were invited to John McCain's funeral. Uh, any 
state funeral in this country, you George and Rose Bush. are there, George Bush, and I see you there on television, and um, yay. But here's my point. You are a black man with power and influence, and you get your phone calls returned. Let's change that around now, and let's talk about the typical black man in America that doesn't have that power. Yes. Middle class, educated, lesser educated, working class, professional. It's not about the, the content of the character or accomplishments. It's, you still feel it's there. The color, you know it's there, the color of the skin. Because our lives become to end when we're becoming silenced on the thing that's happening around us. And now we're facing a huge challenge in our life. And that challenge is not happening just in our life. It's also happening in the life of our children and our grandchildren to come. If we don't prepare this world to make this world a better place for them, we're just going to leave this world and leave much disaster behind. And we need to teach each other how to love each other. And so many of us go to the church, accept Jesus as the, the Savior, but when they leave the church, they don't know how to accept somebody as uh, their brothers. All they knew that Jesus died for me, but the other one, I don't know him. If I have to kill him, I have to kill him because he doesn't belong to my place. And this type of the world that we are living in, they have to end. The world is changing. God has wanted us to live as his children. We belong to the same father. You know, there's only one God that we worship. There's no three, four God. But it doesn't matter which color of your skin. You can be in China and Korea and Africa. People still worship the world that come up to them, Jesus Christ. So what making us to hate each other? What, what are we fighting for? What are we gaining? What make the policeman to put his knee to George's neck and put his hands in his pocket like nothing was happening? And then you have others, police officers, if you want to speak to that, who were standing there he was sitting there. Himself, And it was the other one who helped him make sure that the man doesn't move. Then there was one of them who was trying to block nobody to film what was happening. Where is their heart today? Did they feel like they accomplished their mission? Did they feel like they accomplished something? This world is bothering everybody. You know, when there's a problem affecting one part of the society, it becoming a responsibility of everyone living in this planet. This problem of injustice, of a brutality, of policemen, white policemen against black kids or black men need to stop. Because that issue is affecting right now the world that we are living in. As you and I are talking today, you can turn the TV on. There's a mass protest going on in Paris, in London, in South Africa, in all over the city around the world. There was few, well, three protests today in Canada, in Toronto, in Montreal, and uh, Nova Scotia. It was a big protest today I was watching on TV. Why? The people who are protesting, they don't even look like me. But they're white. They are concerned. They don't want to leave this world after they're no longer here. Being a bad world for the children, that way people hate each other because of the color of their skin. We need to end that. You said in your interview with the Denver Post, if you're living in this planet, if it's not your concern about what's going on, yes, sir. that means you don't live here. You don't. You're living in other places. I think George, speaking of the victim here, I think George Floyd didn't deserve to die. Don't tell me someone would get killed no matter the color of his race because of $20 or whatever, $10. Come on. I've seen people do bad things more than that, and they don't get killed. Because we witness crime every day, and they don't care. 
So Dikembe, my brother in Jesus Christ, talk about the church, our church, talk about the church in America. What do we do? Because what all of this is, you know, when I look at, when I look at what racism does, racism, it is rooted in the pride of life and some ignorance as well. And what racism does for the Christian or anyone, it prevents us from Christ's command of loving our neighbor. So as a Christ follower, what do we need to do? We need to be sensitive, and, that, and, and I think there's a way that we can be peaceably proactive. This is our way, in part, as a church, of saying, enough. I know you. You you are also a friend of peace officers, police officers. You are in our church. We have police officers here, and they, they gravitate you, you to them. And even the Denver Post commented, when you come to Denver, you've got police officer friends that you'll have breakfast, I lunch with. Yeah, and you did today. So that's just who you are. So, and you're not condoning what's going on to destroy no, property. No, all the policemen are bad. Yeah, no, you, all of them. You know them. And, but there's some bad actors. But the human heart is desperately wicked because of sin. What's the solution to this? There are things as global citizens we can do, activism, speaking out, being more sensitive, people like me and others of my generation. But in the spiritual realm, as a Christ follower, what do we need to be praying? What do we need to be doing and checking our hearts and, and conveying to others this message of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness? Because this is a sin issue. It's a fallen world issue. What's your thoughts? Oh, Pastor, I'm, I'm so glad that you raised that question. I think you as a man of God, as a spiritual leader of this church, I think you have a major role to play in our society, in our community today. Not just you, you and your friends and all the leaders, all of the major mega churches in this country. I think the world now are looking at you guys, not just to our politician. Because people are looking for peace and people, people are looking for a healing in their heart. They're hurting. And they're, they're hurt right now. We're in a bad time right now. We already lost more than 1,500 people from COVID-19, from this pandemic, that have destroyed the fabric of our society, Pastor. 105,000 now. We lost so many grandmothers. We lost so many brothers. We lost sisters. We lost uncles. I lost teammates. I lost friends, young, from this pandemic. My own best friend that I call a brother, Patrick Ewing, was a victim of this disease last week. So these have come close to their home. So now we go from there, we've been praying for that. You've been praying for that every, almost every Sunday about this pandemic that is hurting us, that is not giving us a chance to come here in this beautiful century and to pray together as a follower of Christ. We're not getting that chance. Now we have this injustice. It's coming in front of our eyes. And I think as a pastor, it's time for you and others to raise your voices that God gave to you, the platform that God put you in, to tell God's children, look at the Ten Commandments. Do not kill. It's there in the Bible. It's nothing new. Do not hurt your neighbors. It's there in the Bible. There's nothing new here as a fall of Christ. And I think if you can help us to that direction and make, get us to come close to the faith, and I think we have a chance to heal from this, to make us understand that God created all of us equal. No, because you live in Africa, you live in South America, or I live in the north of America. We all are, worship him. We all are crying and praying that one day we will meet each other again in heaven. And I think in the door of heaven, Pastor, you preach about this all the time. 
When we're going to land up there, they're not going to say, no, no, you're black, you're Chinese, you're brown, you cannot come in Angola. No, there's no place in the Bible where they talk about race. We don't know even what color of the skin was Jesus Christ. Was he yellow? Was he white? Was more dark skin? Was he mixed? But we know he's our, he's our savior. And he's going to welcome us to the kingdom because we follow him and we follow his command. So pray for me that I'll accept that challenge and would you help me with your influence to be I'm that doing kind of, that every day, Pastor. Be that kind you of go to my social media. First thing is coming up in all of my sentences. Even people start saying, stop telling people to pray. People are hurt right now, Dikembe. You can see a lot of people are commenting. Yeah. Say, Dikembe, say something. You keep saying that, that we need to pray. That's the only way I can find my healing as a black man. Right. I have to learn how to forgive. But in the same token, Pastor, I don't want to turn my other cheek so I can get hit on the other side. I want to forgive the one who hurt me from my right side. But in the same token, I want to know why did he hurt me before I turned the other cheek? I'm not going to turn it. And is that the world that we are living in? When somebody hurts you, let go to the source why that person is hurting you. What causing him to hurt you? What is going on to his heart? What bothering him? Is he a believer or he lost sight? Because we start this show by talking about that. We have to live by faith. You know, you take all the way to the book of Hebrew. When they say that with our faith is impossible to please him, who must believe in him got to know that it exists. First, do you have a faith for him? Do you believe in him? Do you believe that he came down to this earth to save us? Or he came down so he can make us becoming a killers? And we need to stay strong, Pastor. And you as men of, of God and the spiritual leader of this community of East Abati Church, you need to take your member with you. So this is not what God wants us to do. We have so many nice policemen that, that come here to protect us every Sunday to make sure that we have a beautiful place to worship, that no bad apple can come here to hurt us. We have so many other nice policemen who are in the community that I see every time I go to the gas station <laughs> or I go to the grocery store that I have to say hi to. They are no bad. But we need to find a way, how can we identify those bad apple inside the basket and remove them? Maybe, maybe not remove them, make them change heart. You know, this is what we need the message from all of our spiritual readers. Mm -hmm. To preach the gospel of God on those who need to change their heart. Because there's a lot of people who are struggling. Forty some million people have lost their job, Pastor. And people are hurt. People are in a search of soul. And some of them, all they need, they just need a wall of mercy coming up from the mouth like your mouth, and maybe it will help them. If God would give us a spiritual awakening, so much of this would wash away with those sins. And we could see reconciliation, and we could see healing, and we could see the peace that I believe with all my heart God wants us to experience, a oneness, a unity. Dikembe, um, how can we be praying for you? You've been transparent. You've bared your soul here today, and thank you. It's not been easy. You've probably done a million interviews in your life. Uh, it's a lot. Um, and this is, uh, this is an important thing that you've done today. Thank you. I love you. How can we pray for you and for Rose and Generally, how can we pray these days? Because we do. You talk about we need the power of prayer. How can we pray for you, um, your family? As a black man living on this time of the killing of George Floyd and Amman, just here in Georgia, three, four hours away from our home here, 
near to Albany, and I have so many friends who live uh, in Brownsville, Georgia, and uh, there's a great um, organization that is based there in Brownsville, Georgia, that gave us all the medical supply we want every year, three to four containers. This is for the hospital you have in Africa. From the hospital that's named after your mother. And uh, there are no bad people who live there in Brownsville, Georgia. There's some good people there because I have relationship right. to some great organization there. And I think for me and my wife and our three beautiful kids, um, we just need to pray so that God can protect us, um, give us strength, send of his angel to look after us um, as we leave our house, as we go to sleep, because there's not much we can ask right now. Um, we're asking for the spiritual healing uh, because we all are hurt as a black man, as a father, as a brother. I have people calling me and people want me to stand up to be the voice of injustice. As you know, Pastor, uh, I'm the global ambassador of the NBA. So I carry the moral duty to represent more than 450 men who play in the NBA. And uh, my voice means a lot every time I put something on the social media or I say something on the television. So I ask you to pray for all of my brothers and sisters from WNBA as well, uh, for their healing, for what they're going through. And uh, for some of them who are looking for the answer, what should they say? And uh, they have not found it yet. Maybe God will give them the voice. And the Lord will use you to help them move in that direction. Um because of Christ and the platform he's given, you're such a force for good. You hate evil and desire to see people live in peace. And uh, you are a peacemaker. That's your reputation. I know I'll your try. heart's heavy. I know this has not been easy today, but I want to thank you for responding so quickly and generously with your time. And uh, Eastside family, I hope that you really will lift up the Kimbe and Rose and their sons at a critical time. Um, in so many ways, it is, if we're honest, it's difficult to identify the things that he said today in our own personal lives. You bring the challenge of race, celebrity, leadership. These dear people need our prayers. So lift them up and let us determine to learn from this and let us work very hard as a church not to take steps back, but to take steps forward for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And then thank you for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with you today.